Stephen A. Smith Show starts right now. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airwaves of ESPN Radio and ESPN News, 250 plus markets across the United States of America, plus ESPN Radio on Sirius XM Channel 80, plus ESPN Radio, simulcast over the live national television airwaves of ESPN News. Number to call up as always is 888-SAY-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. This Mother's Day. Show mom just how much you appreciate her love and support with 1-800-Flowers.com. Right now, you can get 36 sorbet roses for just $36. To order, go to 1-800-Flowers.com, click the radio icon, and enter code Stephen A. That's with a PH, not a V. Top Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no conscience. Lots of stuff to get into. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. How do? How do? Hope everybody's well. In the South, I love Nashville, Tennessee. Beautiful, beautiful city. Not to mention the fact that it's a state with no state income taxes. So I love Nashville, Tennessee. Doesn't bother me at all. Side of the night's NFL draft. Lots of stuff to get into. The New York Giants, are they going to take Dwayne Haskins? The New York Jets, is it going to be Josh Allen or somebody else? Lots of stuff. Who's the team with the most pressure to produce? This particular NFL draft, is it the Oakland Raiders? Is it the Arizona Cardinals? Is it the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Who the hell is it? All of those things are things that we need to get into because we'll have to have a discussion. Sal Palantonio, the great Sal Palantonio, is coming on the show halfway through this hour. The wonderful Josina Anderson, NFL reporter extraordinaire. She'll be live on with us from Arizona. Looking forward to talking to her as well, along with a few others. So stay tuned. Don't touch that dial. The NFL Draft is tonight in Nashville, Tennessee. And we'll get into all of that in just a second. Let me start off by saying this about the reigning, defending, two-time champion Golden State Warriors of the National Basketball Association who flat out wet the bed last night, up 3-1, pushing the Los Angeles Clippers to the brink of elimination. They did What they did was simply turn around and defend like trash. Patrick Beverly dropped five three-pointers. Lou Williams came off the bench, dropped 33. Montrell's Harold looking like the second coming of Dennis Rodman. Or on the court, off the court in the post-game conference, he looked like a taller version of Little Wayne. Nevertheless, the Los Angeles Clippers went into the Oracle in Oakland, California and beat the two-time reigning defending champion, Golden State Warriors. And if for the first time, I believe there's legitimate reason for concern. And the reason why I believe there's legitimate reason for concern, ladies and gentlemen, is very, very simple. When you can't defend, if you can't defend Lou Williams, Montrell's Harrell, or Patrick Beverly, what the hell are you going to do against James Harden, CP3, Eric Gordon and the crew. What the hell are you going to do against them if you can't defend? You can't be disciplined and focused and dogged enough to close the deal. Now, Clay Thompson talked about going back to Los Angeles, and he said, hey, listen, we just need to go back there and handle our business. That's what he said. Handle our business, blow them out, do what we got to do. But in the end, what this comes down to, ladies and gentlemen, more so than anything else, is the Golden State Warriors appreciating the position that they're in. The, the New Houston Rockets did them a favor by losing game four, avoiding sweeping the Utah Jazz, and having a game five be played last night because the belief was they were going to get an exhorted, uh, you know, get some additional rest. And because they blew that opportunity, 
The series was supposed to end the same night Golden State was supposed to end the series, and they were supposed to start playing one another this weekend. Instead, Houston closes things out. They finished their series with Utah. Donovan Mitchell, my man, struggled miserably last night. And the Golden State Warriors were supposed to handle their business, and they did not do that. I will tell you this. As far as I'm concerned, when you've got Kevin Durant, who dropped 45 last night, when you've got shooters like Klay Thompson and Steph Curry, you're going to be all right offensively. I don't give a damn what the situation is. Defensively, however, if you're going to periodically struggle the way the Golden State Warriors struggled last night, ladies and gentlemen, the Houston Rockets might be going to the finals. I'm still not ready to bet my money on that. I don't believe it. I'm certainly not ready to make that uh, 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 you know, a foregone conclusion. But I will tell you, the Golden State Warriors' defensive performance last night has given me cause to pause. And as a result, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that they're going to the finals. Houston's probably salivating at the mouth to get their hands on them. And all of a sudden, everybody's in play. Because you look at the way Denver's played against San Antonio the last two games, three games. When you look at the way Portland looked in a series against Oklahoma City, you got either of those teams that could give Houston a run for its money. So now if the Golden State Warriors are in jeopardy and somehow, some way, Houston's able to knock them off, we might not know who the hell's going to the NBA Finals coming out of the West, which means we might not know who the champion's going to be, which means before we know, for all we know, Toronto or Milwaukee can end up being the NBA champions if we're not careful. Now I want to be very, very clear about who I'm rooting for or who I'm rooting against. I am rooting against the Toronto Raptors. Beautiful city. Fantastic city. Phenomenal. Here's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. My self-interest matters. I don't have global entry. I've been trying to get global entry for months. And I can't get global entry. For some odd reason, their computers ain't up and people ain't being eligible for global entry. I have been trying to get global entry for four months. Four and a half months to be exact and counting. And I still don't have global entry, which means that those lines are going to be exorbitantly long. And I want no parts of that while I'm traveling for the NBA Finals. That's right. I'm putting my personal interest first. I don't feel like standing in line for customs, all of that stuff. I don't feel like dealing with that. I ain't got to do that if I fly to Milwaukee. I ain't got to do that if I go to Philadelphia. I don't have to do that if I go to Boston. But I will have to do that if I go to Toronto. So nobody's rooting against Toronto more than me. But that is the reason why. I don't have global entry. Anybody with any government hookups, hook a brother up. I need help. I don't have global entry. Now let me get to what the real story is. And that's the NFL draft. And that's why we've got Sal Palantonio coming on 30 minutes past this hour. That's why we'll have Mr. CIA himself, former executive with the Jets and the Miami Dolphins, the one and only Mike Tannenbaum, who, by the way, is an incredibly nice man. He's really a nice guy. I'm looking forward. I just tease him a little bit. But I have fun with Mike Tannenbaum. I'm looking forward to talking to him. Oh, by the way, Josina Anderson, NFL reporter extraordinaire. Usually when there are breaking stories occurring and it doesn't come the way of the great Adam Schefter, it comes through her. She's very plugged in, looking forward to talking to her. She's coming at us live from Arizona because she's covering the Cardinals, who have the number one overall pick for the night's NFL draft. Now, some of you might be interested in the Cardinals, and I guess I can understand why. I don't find it that interesting. They're going to take Kyler Murray. You don't hire Kingsbury to be your coach, who I will remind everybody is not qualified to be the coach. Damn it, I ain't apologizing for that. It's just the truth. Mr. Kingsbury had a less than 500 record as a college coach, got fired from the job there, got hired as offensive coordinator at USC, and before he had a chance to go to Roscoe's for chicken and waffles, the dude got hired as an NFL head coach. He did not deserve the job. I am about process. This ain't about race. I don't give a damn what color or ethnicity the coach is. Black, white, or anything in between. That don't matter to me. But damn it, have the credentials to be a head coach. What did this man do to be the head coach for the Arizona Cardinals? The answer would be nothing. There's plenty of coordinators. There's plenty of pro personnel directors. There are plenty of scouts. There's plenty of coaches, period, on the NFL and even on the collegiate level that were more deserving of a head coaching job on the NFL level than Kingsbury. 
I mean, since Kingsbury got the job, Cliff Kingsbury, how come Kevin Sumlin didn't get the job? The hell with it. Why don't you bring Herm Edwards back? What about David Shaw at Stanford? I mean, the list goes on and on. You want to go that route, why didn't you woo back Jim Harbaugh? Something. Why did you sit up there and say to Urban Meyer, look, you ain't got to worry about no college football scandals on a pro level. We pay it. Leave Ohio State, come take a head coaching job. I didn't have no problem with that. Urban Meyer's one of the greatest coaches in collegiate football history. By the way, the weather's a little bit nice in Arizona. We'll drive for you. You just got to coach football. You ain't got to worry about recruiting. You ain't got to worry about going to parents' homes, promising them you'll take care of their kids, being a father to 65-plus kids. You ain't got to worry about all of that. Just coach the damn football team. You could have done that. But they hired Cliff Kingsbury. And oh, by the way, you would think he recruited Baker Mayfield and got him to come to Texas Tech. You would think he recruited... Tyler Murray, Tyler Murray, and got him to come to Texas Tech. No, he had relationships. He talked to these people. They didn't come play for him. So what's the problem? I really don't understand this. I really, really don't. But he believes in Tyler Murray, and I like that. I really don't. I have yet to find one football aficionado that could definitively tell me where would Kyler Murray fall in the draft if Cliff Kingsbury were not the coach in Arizona and they were not going to take him number one? Where would he fall? Nobody has an answer for me. So that leaves me a bit suspect about Kyler Murray in terms of how they feel about him. How I feel about him, he's a dual threat. Dude averaged more than seven yards a rush. The dude threw for over 4,000 yards. The dude won the Heisman after got in Oklahoma to the college football playoffs a year after Baker Mayfield did it. So I believe in Kyler Murray. And I believe Arizona should take him number one. I think it's all smoke and mirrors. I don't think they're going to allow anybody to trade up. And I don't think they're going to trade down. They're going to draft Kyler Murray. That's what I believe is going to happen. I'm really, I really could care less. It's not that interesting to me. Here's where it gets very interesting to me. The New York Giants. Now listen. Let's just be very, very clear about what we're saying here. If you are the New York Giants, what possible excuse can you have not to draft Dwayne Haskins out of Ohio State? Threw for nearly 5,000 yards, 4,800 plus. Threw for 50 touchdowns. We see all the superlatives associated with this kid and what he brings to the table, and yet somehow, some way, People continue to find ways to create question marks about this guy. I don't understand it. I really don't. I'm at a loss. If you're the New York Giants, what are you doing? To me, you got to do something. I don't know how you could pass up on Dwayne Haskins. When you watch Eli Manning, 37 years old, look like he's going on 50. Eli Manning, did y'all know this? Eli Manning doesn't even wait to get touched to go down anymore. Eli Manning goes down at the sight of a rush. At the sight of a rush. He hears footsteps, he goes down. He sees an arm flailing in his direction, he goes down. He sees a bull rush coming at him, not confident that his offensive linemen are going to be able to, to block effectively for him. He goes down. This is what Eli Manning has done. So I don't understand for the life of me how the New York Giants, with 12 picks, two picks in the first round, one second round pick. I don't understand how you're passing up on a quarterback, especially Dwayne Haskins. Now, if you listen to folks out there, you talk about Drew Locke out of Missouri, you talk about Daniel Jones out of Duke, you're talking about these guys potentially being more attractive than the New York Giants. That doesn't make sense to me. When I look at this kid, Dwayne Haskins, that simply does not make sense to me. You're the New York Giants. You've missed the playoffs six times in the last seven years since you've won Super Bowl 46. You've already traded Odell Beckham Jr. All right? That's what you've done. You've traded Olivia Vernon. Eli's 38 years old. He's entering the final season of his current contract. He was sacked 47 times last season, pressured on 28% of his pass plays. And I guess you, if you're Dave Gettleman, the general manager for the New York Giants, 
You're using that as an excuse to say, see, it really wasn't his fault. If we protected him better, if we made sure he didn't get sacked as much, then guess what? He would have looked better. Here's the problem. Some of the sacks, you know how Eli Manning got sacked? They said, ah! That's how he got sacked. They were in the vicinity, they screamed at him, and his behind went down. Because when you're 38 years old, and you've been in the league since your early 20s, and you've been hit repeatedly over the years, ladies and gentlemen, it, 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 it hurts, damn it. You get scared. This is what happens. And it's not Eli Manning's fault. The man delivered two Super Bowls. Nobody's knocking him for the career that he's had. But what we're saying is there comes a point in time where you have to realize it's over. And you got to move in a different direction. The New York Giants desperately, desperately, desperately need a quarterback. And Dwayne Haskins probably is the best of the lot. I understand that Gettleman is old school. I understand. You look at some of these cats like Devin White out of LSU, Josh Allen out of Kentucky, and others. You desperately need an edge rusher. If Josh Allen is there available at number six, you know that the Giants are thinking big time about grabbing him. Why? Because you desperately need an edge rusher. I understand that. I get it. I kept asking that question, asking that question, asking that question. And it's not a matter of football acumen or absence thereof. Understand where I'm coming from, ladies and gentlemen. When I watched the divisional playoff game between the New England Patriots and the Los Angeles Chargers, listen to what I'm saying. You don't play the game, then you watch the game. If you watch the game, listen to this scenario and tell me how y'all would feel. You had Joey Bosa, who is considered somewhat elite in his position, being an edge rusher for the Chargers. He was mic'd up for the game. And if you watch the NFL Network and you watch them talk about <clears throat> the game and they were mic'd, you listen to Joey Bosa going up to Tom Brady. Man, will you, will, will you stop getting rid of the ball so quickly? Give me a chance to get to you. Would you please, please, please? Because Bill Belichick and them had Tom Brady getting rid of the football in two and a half seconds, max. So my point is, no matter what we thought about Joey Bosa, he was a complete non-factor because New England was getting rid of the football and there was nothing he could do. And then to top it off and to make it even worse, he was still mic'd and they had him on the sideline, people. And Joey Bosa was like, that Tom Brady's awesome. He's phenomenal. I mean, I just say, oh my God, he's greatest. Did you, I mean, go back and listen to the tapes. You're marveling at this guy because basically what you're saying is you are helpless to do anything against him, just like you would be helpless to do anything against an elite quarterback. Well, guess what? If you have an opportunity to draft an elite quarterback, ain't that all the evidence you need? Now, if you don't believe that they're elite and you don't believe they're going to be effective and you don't believe they can play, that's different. But if it's clear somebody can ball and they're at the quarterback position, how in the hell do you pass up on them, New York Giants? It makes no sense, particularly when your alternative is hoping and praying that a quarterback is going to be available 11 picks later and also depending on a 38-year-old quarterback who showed you he was punch drunk at least two to three years ago. It makes absolutely, positively no sense whatsoever. And I got a real problem, a real problem. with the New York Giants even contemplating passing up a quarterback, the likes of Dwayne Haskins for this upcoming draft. It's not an exact science, and I know people are popular to say that, but damn that. All of us get paid to do a job. Yes, we make mistakes. None of us are flawless. I totally understand that. I would know, but the reality is clear. When you have a job to do, you better come pretty damn close to doing it effectively if you want to keep it. And if you're the New York Giants and you've missed the playoffs six times in the last seven years, how the hell are you effective? So at some point in time, we got to have this discussion. And we got to recognize the fact that you're the New York Giants, you got to grab a quarterback. If you're the New York Jets, you got a totally different need. You got Sam Donald. And oh, by the way, getting back to the New York Giants for a second, you know what nobody else has brought up? If the New York Giants pass up a quarterback, 
this draft, how many teams who've been missing the playoffs, who have an aging quarterback clearly beyond his prime, goes back-to-back NFL drafts with top six picks and pass on quarterbacks each time? Last year, you got Baker Mayfield there. You got Sam Donald there. You got Josh Rosen there. You got This is all you got. This is what you have. And the New York Giants passed up on three to four quarterbacks in last year's NFL draft to draft Saquon Barkley, who's an absolute stud, very true, but you passed up on a quarterback. So now you're going to piggyback off that and pass up on a quarterback for the second consecutive year? Do y'all have any idea how bad that is? You can't do this if you're the New York Giants. You just can't do this. Not back-to-back years when the quarterback position clearly is disabled. You got to take a quarterback. It's simple as that. You're the New York Jets, not your problem. You got Sam Donald. And you draft, and I'm sorry, not draft, but you acquired a running back in free agency in Le'Veon Bell, who you just gave $52 million to. You're the New York Jets. You've got six picks, including one in the first round. Number three overall, Adam Gase is your new coach, who replaced Tom Bowles five after four years, now the defensive coordinator in Tampa. You got a new offensive coordinator. You got a new defensive coordinator in Greg Williams. But the Jets have missed the playoffs eight straight years. Third longest drought in the NFL. This is the second year in a row you've got the third overall pick. Last year you traded up to get the number three to grab Sam Donald. This year you're going to have, in all likelihood, Quinnen Williams out of Alabama, Josh Allen out of Kentucky, Devin White out of LSU, considered by some to be the best player in the draft at that linebacker spot because he's great in coverage, which a lot of linebackers find themselves having to deal with these days. <coughs> Excuse me. But with all of that being said, I think if you're the New York Jets, you grab Josh Allen, number three. You get an edge rusher, because the one thing you haven't done great is get to the quarterback. You gotta get you gotta get a you gotta get an edge rusher. Josh Allen appears to be that dude. In some people's eyes, even better than Nick Bosa, who's expected to go number two to San Francisco. I'm saying if you got Josh Allen there, you gotta take him. That's my belief. What about y'all? 888 say ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. That was Straight Talk Wireless. Nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. We'll get to your calls and more. Remember, the great Sal Palantonio is coming up next to talk to us about a variety of things, all things NFL, because we know that man is the man on the NFL. So I can't wait to talk to the great Sal Palantonio. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. By the way, gentlemen, fellas, Stop lounging around. Be active. Take your girl out. Go to a game or a concert. Get tickets to something. Plus, the NBA playoffs are here, and the time is now to jump on those good seats. So for all your ticket needs, look no further than Vivid Seats, the official ticket partner of ESPN. Go to VividSeats.com and enter promo code ESPN to get 10% off your first order. Get out. Go have an experience, fellas. Get to the game and use Vivid Seats. Don't buy just any seat. Get a Vivid Seat. Where I think you can look at Damian Lillard and say he is unequivocally underrated. He is awesome. What do you have, 34 in the first half last night? He finishes with 50. He hits this bomb of a shot from 37 feet or about 37 feet. How about this stat? And I just heard this very recently from a dear friend. He said 30 plus feet in this postseason, you know what Dame Lillard is shooting? Like you'd say, what is he, two for 10? No. He's about eight for 12 is what he is. That is unbelievable. And that's Straight Talk Wireless Nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. Let's take a listen to Dame Lillard, who, and you would agree, right? Of all the guys that we love in the NBA, that Lillard has to be right up there as far as, as just he's underrated. Wouldn't you say? I mean, he's underrated. That's how good he is. If I said to the average NBA fan, rank the top players for me, where do you think, realistically, the average NBA fan is going to put Dame Lillard? 
I bet she's not a top eight. He's got to be. He has to be. He's sensational. And OKC, that's another story completely. But let's hear from Dame Lillard, his thought process on the, the final shot that he took to win the game and the series last night. I didn't want to put it in the referee's hands, you know, where if there was contact and maybe they get away with contact or I end up having to take a tougher shot because there is, you know, contact and they don't want to decide the game. Um, so I was standing there looking at the rim and I was like, this is a, a comfortable range. My trainer, Phil Beckner, we was working out the other night in OKC and he was just like, just take a few, take a few deep ones, you know, off the dribble. Let's let's shoot a few deep ones. And he was like, I'm telling you, you're going to hit one of these. Um, when I was standing there, I was like, I'm going to shoot it. You know, he was he was a little bit off of me, and I was like, it's enough space for me to just raise up and shoot it for game. And at the last second, he stepped towards me a little bit, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to pound dribble sidestep and, and raise up, you know. And I just had to, to let it fly, you know, shoot the ball high in the air to give it a chance, and you know, that's what I did. And that's what he did, and, and away we go. And, and Portland moves on. So And, you know, it's funny thing. There was a couple of series. I think the two series that realistically most people thought – you could have an upset in the first round. Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. And you can touch with the show. ladies walk by here and sit in the audience listening or watching me do uh, this show right now and you know the thing that bothers me they got on shirts that, that said first take I, I don't have a first take shirt I don't have a first take shirt what is with all of these people that walk around with these first take shirts and the staff at first take never thinks to give me one I mean I don't understand I just don't understand everybody got to eat I mean you walk I see these yesterday I just saw these people these nice black short sleeve collared ESPN shirts. I've only been working for ESPN for, since 2003. I mean, I took a two-year hiatus, but I've been, I been—I was going from 2009 to 2011. But minus the two years, I've been at ESPN for over 15 years, and I don't have a damn shirt. I, I just, I, eh, uh. Hello, ladies. How y'all doing? You know, I mean. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You know, I, I bet you if Sal Palantonio was working on First Take or had his own nationally syndicated radio show, even though he deserves it because he's that big time, I bet you Sal Palantonio would have an ESPN shirt or a First Take shirt. What's going on, Sal Pal? How are you, sir? You know, I, I, I've never gotten that ESPN shirt. And I've done a lot uh -huh. of live shots and a lot uh -huh. of stadiums and training camps. And you? I never got. I, I gotta go to the. Sh I gotta go to the store on campus and stock up, and make sure my producer and cameraman has one too. But I, I've never. Been oh, so so you don't have a shirt. So you've never had the shirt. No, I never had the shirt. Oh, well, then we never. good then. Oh, well, so they're not discriminating against me. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Because misery <laughs> loves company, bro. Misery no, loves company. They just Look. they discriminate against people from Queens, New York. Is what they're doing. <laughs> The great Sal Palantonio right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio. ESPN News. Buddy, I know you're going to be covering the New York Giants tonight. They've got the number six overall pick in this upcoming NFL draft. What are you hearing about what they're going to do? Because there's so much noise as to whether or not they're going to grab Dwayne Haskins or they're going to grab a defensive player. You know Gettleman and you know the Giants. What do you think is going to happen, buddy? Well, they got a lot to play with, 12 picks, two in the first round. Yeah. You look at this team, they don't right now, in my view, in my view, having studied it, just hosted two NFL draft specials on the NFL matchup show, went through mm -hmm. all the quarterback play. And I was here when they drafted Eli Manning in 2004. Mm -hmm. I've studied his career. I know him inside and out. And I think he's got a lot left. And I think they don't have a quarterback problem this season. I think Eli Manning, as a starter here, is going to be just what they need. Now, do they have to draft his successor, look for his successor? No mm -hmm. question, for two reasons. One, he's only mm -hmm. under contract this year. He's a free agent next season. Mm -hmm. And two, he's 38 years old. And you're better having somebody in the building to learn under a guy like Eli. I mean, Eli Manning has been perfect for New York. His demeanor... Mm -hmm the way he approaches his job, his professionalism, and his results. I mean, you really can't argue with any of that. And uh, you I look can't. at this team, 
Okay, well, you can look at this team last year, and they improved offensively. 7.7 points a game from 2017. But, 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 that was second best Sal, in the NFC. Sal, and they me, led the division. Let me they jump in. Division in point, point let, scored. let me jump in. You and I go back two decades. You know how I am. You know I'm not going to let you get away with that. You know good and well there were some times when it was garbage time and the Giants were sitting up there and padding those numbers, even though he did complete 66% of his passes. The fact is you also know he goes down at the sight of an oncoming rush now. He don't even wait to get hit. It's not the same. And they've missed the playoffs six times in the last seven years. When do we get to look at the quarterback, Sal Palantonio, for those folks that are New York Giants fans asking this question? When do we get to look at your level of production and say, excuse me, with a better quarterback, there might be better results? Well, I don't know if any of these first-round guys are better than Eli Manning right now. But I, right I now. Do think that they do think that they have to draft a successor. But the last thing you want to do is get yourself into a situation where you are reaching for a player based on need. So or if you really like Drew Locke and you think he can be Eli Manning's successor and you've done your due diligence, then by all means, take him. Take him in the first round. I think the Giants are in that mode for sure. They want, to, they want to find that guy, whoever it is, whether it's Drew Locke or Daniel well, Jones or perhaps going back up into the first round and right. taking Will Greer if none of those players are available at 17. But as for this season, mm-hmm. Eli Manning is going to be fine. He's going to be good enough for this team this year. And he's not going anywhere. He's going to play in 2020, whether it's here or someplace else. I just talked to somebody very close to to Eli, and I just reported this on Sports Center that Eli will be playing somewhere in 2020 for somebody. And so, you know, here's the thing: you you said he don't like to get hit. Who likes to get hit? Well, you know what yeah, I'm right? saying. Don't, don't be so like literal with me. Hold on, Sal, 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 Sal listen. Like Sal, Sal, like check this out, Sal. First of, all, Sal. first of all, Sal, I only got about five minutes left, and I got you know too damn much about the NFL for me to be fixated on one team while I got you on the line. So work with me I here a little so. bit. But don't you dare quote me literally by saying, oh, who likes to get hit? You know what the <laughs> hell I mean. He's going out down at the sight of a rush, Sal. Stop oh, it. Man, listen, Eli didn't draft Eric Flowers. Well, I know that. I know that Eric okay. Flowers was trash. I get all of that, but you also know what you've seen in Eli. And again, that's the reality of the situation, but that's fine. Let me ask you this question. If they had to take a quarterback at six overall, what are you hearing? Will it be Haskins? Will it be Locke? Will it be the guy out of Duke? Daniel Jones? Which one are you hearing? I don't think that they will take a quarterback at six. I okay. think they will take, I think that they will take what their board says to take, which is a great defensive player. This team needs a stand-up rush outside linebacker on the right side, a guy who can stand up and rush the passer. Now, Josh Allen needs some polish. He needs some upper body strength. He's got one move. It's a good move. He can improve. This is the actual anniversary of them taking Michael Strahan in 1995. So they've come away with a pass rusher at number six. Remember, they couldn't rush the passer last year. The key in the NFL is two things. One, score early, rush the passer in the fourth quarter. If you can't rush the passer in the fourth quarter, you're going to give up a lot of late leads, and that's what the Giants did. The Giants are not the only team you know a lot about. Obviously, you've got Philly Roots, formerly working at the Philadelphia Inquirer, living in that area, working at that paper with me for years. Here's the question. We yes, not sir. so much about the draft, but we are hearing about them potentially looking to trade Nelson Aguilar. We know that Nick Foles is going in in Jacksonville right now. We know yes, that sir. Carson Wentz, and we heard what Donovan McNabb had to say about the pressure that should be on Carson Wentz in the upcoming season and beyond. What are your thoughts with all the noise you've been hearing about the Philadelphia Eagles real quick? Well, I was there when they drafted Carson Wentz and studied pretty much every pass he's ever thrown. And we can talk blue in the face, but here's the bottom line. Carson Wentz knows, and the team knows, and Doug Peterson knows, that Carson Wentz has to get on the field, stay on the field, and perform the way he did in 2017 when he was an MVP candidate. Move with the football and throw accurately on the run and throw the deep ball like he was throwing. If he can't do any of those, if he can't do those three things, 
then he can't be a starting quarterback in the NFL the way he wants to play. So, so you agree with Donovan McNabb? So you agree with Donovan McNabb? I, I do agree with Donovan McNabb. I, I think Donovan McNabb has been jumped for no reason. Thank you. What Donovan McNabb, is, what Donovan McNabb has said is, is, is common sense. If, if Carson Wentz can't stay on the field and lead this team to a Super Bowl, then, you know, they have to find another quarterback. He's, the bottom line is Carson Wentz has missed 31% of his starts since his mm. senior year at North Dakota State. Mm. Now, I'm hard-pressed to find any quarterback in the NFL who's starting who's missed that much time since his senior year in college through his first two seasons, three seasons in the mm. NFL. So – He's got to be able to stay on the field. The most, gotcha. I mean, this is the biggest cliche in the world. The most important so, ability is availability. I saw so Donovan McNabb play with broken a broken leg. Sal so Palatone, I'm, I'm, so, so I'm getting very upset at you because you're too knowledge about the sport of football to be giving me these long answers. Well, you know I got a time limit. I got to get to uh, Next time I need 30 minutes from you, Sal. You got to find 30 minutes out of your schedule to educate us about football the way that you can. I don't have enough well, you time agree for these. With me about what Donovan McNabb said. He's been jumped on that. And listen, I understand that the Eagles or his teammates, former teammates, or some They're people in the will be upset. But, I mean, what he said was not wrong. What he said was not wrong. What they said about him was wrong. Five NFC championship games, a Super Bowl appearance, the number two overall pick. I mean, listen, you got to be kidding me. He had every right to say what he said, and I had no issue with it. Before I let you get on out of here, our former colleague here at ESPN, John Gruden, I mean, you look at the Oakland Raiders and the picks that they have available to them. Some would say they're under the most pressure more so than anybody else in the NFL to get this draft right because of what the moves they made last year in accumulating these picks by moving Khalil Mack and Amari Cooper. What do you say about that real quickly? Well, I think it's going to be difficult. Their, their roster is totally depleted. Their defense really needs a lot of help. I don't know what they're going to do. they got a lot of draft picks. I respect Eight. John Gooden. I mm -hmm. respect Mayock. But that's a, that's, that division is not getting any easier. That's going to be a tough road for the Oakland Raiders. Sal Palantonio covering the New York Giants tonight for the NFL Draft. You know I'll be watching you, buddy. Always appreciate the <laughs> education, my man. Thank you for having me. And as before I came on, like five people came in the parking lot here at Giants Stadium and said, we heard you going on Stephen A. So everybody in the building is listening to this right now. Well, I appreciate the love, my man. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon. The great Sal Palantonio right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News, 888-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Get triple action protection for optimal engine performance with Shell V-Power Nitro Plus Premium Gasoline. Also, ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive's Home Insurance. Get your quarter Progressive.com today. Again, we'll get back to your calls in just a few minutes hour number two mr cia himself mr mike tannenbaum former executive for the new york jets former executive for the miami dolphins this man he can keep a secret ladies and gentlemen he can have a conversation with you and at the end of the conversation you're like what the hell did he say i don't know if i got any information from him he's a nice man though very very knowledgeable about the sport of football i'm looking forward to talking to him because since he's not working for a particular nfl team at this moment in time it shouldn't be a conflict of interest for him to give me some juicy information so we're going to talk to him and i'm looking forward to having a conversation with mike tannenbaum at the top of hour number two of the stephen a smith show right here on espn radio espn news but we'll get back to your calls in a minute by the way if you missed my opening segment go check it out on demand in the stephen a smith podcast Brought to you by the Capital One Saver Card. Earn 4% cash back on dining and entertainment, 2% at grocery stores, and 1% on all other purchases. Hey, hey! What's in your wallet? Your radio. Where I, I think you can look at Damian Lillard and say he is unequivocally underrated. He is awesome. What do you have, 34 in the first half last night? He finishes with 50. He hits this bomb of a shot from 37 feet or about 37 feet. How about this stat? And I just heard this very recently from a dear friend. He said 30 plus feet in this postseason. You know what Dame Lillard is shooting? Like you'd say, what is he, two for 10? No. He's about eight for 12 is what he is. That is unbelievable. And that's Straight Talk Wireless Nationwide Coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE 
networks. Let's take a listen to Dame Lillard, who, and you would agree, right? Of all the guys that we love in the NBA, that Lillard has to be right up there as far as, as just, he's underrated. Wouldn't you say? I mean, he's underrated. That's how good he is. If I said to the average NBA fan, rank the top players for me, where do you think, realistically, the average NBA fan is going to put Dame Lillard? I bet you he's not a top eight. He's got to be. He has to be. He's sensational. And OKC, that's another story completely. But let's hear from Dame Lillard, his thought process on the, the final shot that he took to win the game and the series last night. I didn't want to put it in the referee's hands, you know, where if there was contact and maybe they get away with contact or I end up having to take a tougher shot because there is, you know, contact and they don't want to decide the game. Um, so I was standing there looking at the rim and I was like, this is a, a comfortable range. My trainer, Phil Beckner, we was working out the other night in OKC and he was just like, just take a few, take a few deep ones, you know, off the dribble. Let's let's shoot a few deep ones. And he was like, I'm telling you, you're going to hit one of these. Um, when I was standing there, I was like, I'm going to shoot it. You know, he was he was a little bit off of me, and I was like, it's enough space for me to just raise up and shoot it for game. And at the last second, he stepped towards me a little bit, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to pound dribble sidestep and, and raise up, you know. And I just had to, to let it fly, you know, shoot the ball high in the air to give it a chance, and you know, that's what I did. And that's what he did, and, and away we go. And, and Portland moves on. So, And, you know, this funny thing, there was a couple of series. I think the two series that realistically most people thought – you could have an upset in the first round. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pins Oil performance line. And you can always get in touch with the show through the 1-800-Flowers Twitter. Game? Download the Vivid Seats app. Enter promo code CHAMPS at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Don't buy just any seat. Get a vivid seat. To the phones we go. Mike, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. What's up, Mike? Yeah, what's up, Stephen A.? How you doing? I'm all right. You're live on the air. Go ahead, buddy. Yes, sir. First of all, I wanted to talk about the game last night with the Clippers and Lou Williams, who put in that work last night. Well, you and, only got you only got you, you only got a little bit over a minute, and you just wasted thirty seconds telling me what you wanted to talk about instead of just saying what you got to say, bro. This radio, go ahead. I apologize. I apologize. I apologize. All right, let me get to this topic right here. The OKC Thunder with Russell Westbrook. He, he needs a coach that's going to let him know what it is, and I feel like Mark Jackson is the best option for Russell Westbrook because he plays point guard. I agree. I have no argument there. I like your suggestion. Actually, I like it a lot. So, I hear you. I appreciate the call. Charlie, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, Stephen A. First time, long time. Uh, Thank you. So regarding, the, regarding the last call, you think there's a possibility we could see OKC trade Russell Westbrook this offseason? Um, I don't think so. I think that's a hard, hard contract to get rid of. Russell Westbrook started a $205 million contract. He's getting paid $35 million right now. And although he's incredibly valuable to the franchise that is Oklahoma City because you got a lot of people that obviously um, would not want to lose him, if you're Oklahoma City, you don't want to lose him either because what else you going to get? I know that you want to make – if some people have suggested Sam Presti, look, Paul George is the number one option. But who's going to come to Oklahoma City to play with either of them? That's your dilemma. Hour number two up next. Don't touch that.
on his to-do list as the head coach. It's the quarterback, the quarterback, and the quarterback. Mm. And to me, the really interesting and important guy out there is a guy named Vance Joseph. Vance was a guy I work with at Miami. He was the head coach of the Broncos, and he's the assistant head coach, defensive coordinator of the Cardinals. And I'm sure they're leaning on Vance to do a lot of things in terms of putting the program together, the rules, uh, how it all operates. And basically, you know, you laid out all of the things in Cliff's background, both good and bad, but clearly it's about getting the quarterback right. And I, I'm kind of interested to see how when they turn their cards over tonight, why wouldn't Cliff Kingsbury have to work with Josh Rosen? Josh Rosen's a talented player that maybe, you know, he can make better just the same way that Sean McVay made Goff better. So mm-hmm. it'll be interesting. But, you know, clearly, like to your point, Stephen, Kingsbury's track record and, and background is unusual, to say the least. And this is going to be an important moment for them tonight. And if it's Murray or Rosen, you know, his job, one, two, and three, is to get that player playing at a high level. And I think it's someone like Vance Joseph that's going to do a lot of the other uh, work. Is Colin Murray somebody that should remind us of Michael Vick? Or is he a unique individual in his own right? How should we view him? Yeah, it's interesting. I've heard a lot of different comparisons. You know, Vic's one for sure. You know, physically, he looks a lot like uh, Antoine Randall L., um, a former receiver and uh, college quarterback of the Steelers. Yep. But he has a dynamic arm. He's elusive. Um, and I saw him live a couple times, Stephen. And the thing, the most impressive thing about Murray was the second half of a game he lost against Alabama in the Orange Bowl because – He's playing against eight or nine guys that he's going to be playing against on Sundays. They were terrible. Oklahoma was terrible in the first half, and Murray played really well in the second half. And to me, that spoke to resiliency, mental toughness. And as we know, to be successful as a quarterback in the NFL, what do you do when your jersey gets dirty? What do you do after a three-game losing streak? And the way Murray played in the second half against Alabama, to me, was very encouraging. We're talking to Mike Tannenbaum, former executive, former general manager with the New York Jets, former executive with the Miami Dolphins, now contributing to ESPN as we speak. He's right here with Stephen A., ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Let's go to Dwayne Haskins, right? And I'm going to use him as an example to ask a relatively generic question, Mike Tannenbaum. One minute you hear he's going to go sixth overall. Another minute you hear may he might fall because you know what? They might go the route of defense. Then you hear he might go earlier because the Oakland Raiders might decide to grab a quarterback. Then you hear, oh, excuse me, Drew Locke out of Missouri and Daniel Jones out of Duke may actually be better. Explain to us what's all of that about. How does somebody that throws 50 touchdowns in the Big Ten for Ohio State under Urban Meyer and passes for nearly 5,000 yards, he's all over the place depending on who you ask as the weeks have progressed. How does that come about? Well, obviously, you were reading my Twitter feed before because you would know <laughs> that since 1973, the only quarterbacks drafted in the first round with fewer than 14 starts were Mark Sanchez, Cam Newton, and Mitch Trubisky. So mm. um, I was just tweeting about this earlier. I like Haskins a lot. I have been on record on that. The one concern is he's a one year starter that has a limited amount of uh, games played. Now, he did have uh, 50 touchdowns, he played really well in his last three games. Uh, Northwestern, Michigan, and then in the bowl game. Um, I like him a lot. I think, to answer your question, too, I think if you go back a year ago, there was much more consensus on Mayfield, Darnold, uh, Josh Allen. And I think uh, this year it's a little bit more of the beauties in the eye of the beholder. I think if you polled all 32 teams on Saturday when they turned their cards over, you know, some would have Haskins first. A couple would probably have Locke first. Some would have Murray first. So um, I think Haskins has the size the arm talent to be very successful uh, in the NFL. And I think he's going to go early tonight. And I think he has a chance to be a really good player. But the one question that is going to be asked about him is, and again, he sat behind some very talented people, Cardell Jones, JT Barrett, but he can only get on the field for one year at Ohio State. Mm. Mike Tannenbaum right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. How would you feel as an executive of the New York Giants right now if you've got the number six overall pick, you've got needs in the defensive side of the ball, which Dave Gettleman has been unapologetic about in explaining. Uh, but in the same breath, we've got a 38-year-old quarterback in Eli Manning, although he's a two-time Super Bowl champion. He's has missed the playoffs. He has missed the playoffs six times in the last seven years. He's 38 years old, clearly beyond his prime. What would the pressure be like for you, particularly in New York City, if Dwayne Haskins is there at number six? 
you didn't allow somebody to trade up. You hold on to that pick. What would the pressure be like for you to take Eli Man? I mean, to take Dwayne Haskins with Eli Manning fading? I think you make a really good point. I think one of the hardest things about having these jobs, Stephen A., is uh, you have to, and this is hard because you're fighting human nature, you have to make decisions through the lens of what the player is going to do, not what he did do. And Eli Manning is a guy that's been a giant for his whole career. He's a homegrown Super Bowl champion. But moving forward, obviously, they got to do something about you know his succession plan. And if it's at 6 tonight, if it's at 17, Obviously, that has to be addressed. And, you know, in my mind, nobody's done a better job of that than the Kansas City Chiefs. If we go back two years ago, they trade for Alex Smith, a very competent NFL starter, and then they draft Patrick Mahomes. And Mahomes, you know, sat for a year and didn't play. And really, the Giants, they could really be set up really well if you think about going back a year ago, they take Saquon Barkley, the rookie of the year, a dynamic playmaker. And now, you know, if they draft Eli's replacement, they over a two to three year period could really change the narrative. But I think um, taking Barkley over Darnold a year ago, trading Odell Beckham, all those pieces are really set up for how they execute the next phase of the game plan tonight. Because if you look at the lens of what Eli Mann could do moving forward, to me, you know, that window is obviously closing pretty fast. How can I look if, if you're the New York Giants? What about the notion that it would be a second consecutive draft in which you've elected to pass up on a quarterback having a top six pick? How much does that factor into the pressure equation? Yeah, it's, it's about opportunity. When you have opportunities to take quarterbacks, it's something you need to do. So, uh, again, going back a year ago, they passed on a number of really good quarterbacks. They got a dynamic player, someone that should be, you know, a cornerstone player of the franchise for a long time that everyone, you know, likes and admires. But um, I agree, you know, if, it's going to be hard to pass on that quarterback, you know, in successive years. And that's why, you know, be it 6-17 or maybe they try to come up at the end of tonight where – you know, they have a high second round pick and they try to move, you know, from the bot top of the second back into the bottom of the first and maybe they wind up with, you know, three first round picks. So I'm really intrigued. I think they're one of the big storylines tonight. And I think it goes back a year ago by passing on Darnold. Um, t tonight's the opportunity for them to put all the pieces together. Mike Tannenbaum right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. New York Jets have a new head coach in Adam Gase. Uh, new defensive coordinator in Greg Williams, Dewell Logan's. Uh, low games, rather. He's your new offensive coordinator. They've missed the playoffs eight straight years. I would ask you this question about the New York Jets. Um, I'm looking at this kid, Josh Allen, and you're thinking about the stud that you hear that he is out of Kentucky, 17 sacks, five forced fumbles. You see what he brings to the table. However, when they talk about an edge rusher, they've been giving Nick Bosa all the love ahead of everybody, even though they're talking about Josh Allen's upside. You're the New York Jets. Is it an easy decision for you at the number three spot? Or uh, if, if of course, San Francisco doesn't grab Bosa and you've got a choice between Allen and Bosa at number three, is it a tough spot or do you know definitively who you want? Yeah, well, you know, starting with the head coach, you know, we hired him in Miami and, you know, talking about Kingsbury, like Adam will do a very good job, you know, with Sam Darnold. Sam Darnold will play better, you know, gets his career. He's always done that with quarterbacks, so – um, Jet fans should really be excited about the future of what they can do on offense, and adding Le'Veon Bell will only you know, uh, accelerate on. that process. Hold on, Mike. Can uh, I interrupt you for one quick second here? Let me say this. I'm not comparing Gase, Adam Gase, to Kingsbury because Adam Gase was in the NFL. He's a coordinator. He got the Miami head coaching job before he got to the New York Jets. So there's no issues there. Kingsbury goes from underachieving in college to quitting a coordinator's job that he never did did anything at because he didn't have a chance to because before he even had a chance to practice, he got a head coaching job in the NFL. Agreed. I, 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 I agree. Uh, okay. Now, going back to the defensive side of the ball, you know, if you look at Greg Williams and Joe Vitt, their linebacker coach, I think someone like Josh Allen makes a lot of sense because of his versatility. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that the, they'll be known for is – they, they will be multiple and varied up front. Sometimes they'll have four players rushing. Sometimes they'll have three. Josh Allen's versatility is really intriguing to me. You know, he's a local kid from New Jersey. Uh, he helped turn around a Kentucky program. Every year he got better, 17 sacks this year. And he can cover, and he can, he can do it all. And I think if he's on the board, um, I think it's going to be really hard for the Jets to pass up because I think he's a perfect fit for the way they, they're going to want to play defense uh, at the Jets. What do the Los Angeles Rams need in this draft after just losing in the Super Bowl? Well, you know, 
and I think offensive line, maybe one or two guys, uh, they're getting a little old up front. And uh, you know, Whitworth in particular, who's played really well for them, that was a great sign for them. I thought he was too old, but uh, I was wrong. They were right. That was a great sign by the Rams. I think if they could add one or two more pieces up front, uh, they got a, a good young receiver in Cooper Cup, who tore his ACL uh, last year, Stephen A., yep. who I think has a chance to be really, really good. So, to me, if they could add a couple of pieces on that offensive line, that'd be a good place to start. What about the Los Angeles Chargers? Your thoughts about them real quick, particularly led by Derwin James, who was a first-team All-Pro in a Pro Bowler last year. Yeah, he, he's excellent. He, he's going to be a cornerstone for that team for a long time. You know, w w one thing when you look at uh, the Chargers is, you know, they lost the, uh, Terrell Williams. Uh, he signed with the Raiders, and he was a productive starting receiver for them. So mm -hmm. that could be one place they look. And at some point, you know, likewise with the Giants, Phillip Rivers won't play forever. And I think what's really interesting, you know, we're talking about all these guys like Murray and Haskins and Drew Locke. Josh Rosen could affect tonight as much as anything because does a team like the Chargers, does a team like the Redskins trade up, trade, excuse me, trade for Josh Rosen mm -hmm. if indeed Arizona does take Kyle Murray? So I think – Rose impacts a lot of teams. I think the Chargers could be one of them. As an executive, Mike Tannenbaum, what's the most important position to draft for outside of quarterback? Finding the quarterback's well, number think, one priority. What's number two? Yeah, I think I answered that my first year when I was GMing the Jets in 06. We took two offensive linemen. We took the Berkshaw Ferguson and Nick Mangold. And my view then it remains today, which is if you can't protect, nothing else really matters. And I know that sounds unbelievably basic and fundamental, but – um, it's truly, you know, a, a hallmark I, I believe in. And you look at the Patriots year in, year out, you know, the strength of that team after the quarterbacks, the offensive line. And that also allows you to win on the road because you're dealing with crowd noise, you're dealing with, uh, you know, third down pressures. And if you can't pass protect, it's really hard to win in the NFL. Mike Tannenbaum, I got to say, you did a great job talking to me. I mean, I, first of all, I'm educated. I don't feel like you kept any secrets. It's unbelievable. I got to give you credit, <laughs> man. I got to give you credit. So you see, I'm coachable. Now that I'm your teammate, I'm coachable. <laughs> Thanks a lot, buddy. I appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you down the road. Enjoy the nice draft, okay? Uh, all right. Yeah, any, any time. I appreciate it. Thanks. No problem. Welcome to the family. One and only Mike Tannenbaum right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News, 888 ESPN, that's 888-729-3776. I got a lot of fun with these guys. Listen, when you're sitting in the chair first take, you're sitting in the chair hosting the radio show, you got to be critical of the things you see. There's no question about it. But once people make transitions and then all of a sudden they're playing the analytical role, then you, you, you're reminded of their level of expertise. That doesn't, just because you make the wrong decisions from time to time or just because ultimately you didn't have success at a position doesn't mean you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing. And it certainly doesn't mean that you're not a great guy. And Mike Tannenbaum is a great guy. So I'm happy that he was on the show. I'm happy he's going to be a part of the family. And I'm looking forward to talking to him more in the future, along with a lot of other guys. Listen, man, I was critical of Rex Ryan. Rex Ryan went to back-to-back -back AFC championship games and then missed the playoffs six straight years, okay? Now, I had to call it like I saw it, but it doesn't mean I love Rex any less. I know that man knows his football. I know he knew something. I know he's elite mind when it comes to defensive schemes and planning and what have you. I know he's forgotten more football than I ever know. So let's be clear. Again, you got to be critical when you're analyzing and dissecting and critiquing certain things. But it doesn't mean that you don't respect people and their mind, their intellect, their acumen, and the job that they do when they do a good job. I love interviewing analysts, former executives, and former coaches, and former players in the game because I take it as an opportunity to show them that even though I have to be critical from time to time, the respect is always here for their ability to do the things that they did to get to the point where they had an opportunity to fail. You have to earn the right to get there. Unless, of course, you're Cliff Kingsbury. Then you don't have to earn a damn thing. You just get the job. Back to the phones we go. Let's go to Victor. You're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, Stephen A. A question about the Giants. Um, when they got rid of ODB, it seemed like they had no interest in winning um, you know, this coming year. So why do you feel so strongly about the quarterback class of this year instead of them waiting and putting other pieces in place and looking at the quarterback class of well, next year, which seems to be a heck of well, a lot stronger? Well, first of all, the reason I'm feeling adamant about it is because I don't believe in Eli Manning at all anymore. And I think that you have a glaring need now. 
And I think that when you have a guy, the talent of the likes of a Saquon Barkley, when you have a Sterling Shepard who's been there a few years playing opposite Odell Beckham Jr., you don't just sit up there and concede that this season is going to be a wash. I got news for you. Unlike any other sport, tell me, you can make an argument with baseball to some degree if you want to, although I would disagree. Tell me a sport that you've witnessed where you literally can go from nowhere to be in a Super Bowl contender or a potential Super Bowl champion the very, very next season. It's happened. You've got teams, Philadelphia Eagles came out of nowhere, won the Super Bowl. Carolina Panthers came out of nowhere one year, went to the Super Bowl against Denver. You can make the argument that Denver, I wouldn't say they came out of nowhere because Peyton Manning was there, even though he was, he was done by that time. I'm simply saying parity exists in the National Football League. You don't take any season for granted. When somebody has shown you clearly they're having a tough time getting the job done, I think you need to prepare yourself to move in a, t- in a different direction, particularly when the quarterback that you have in tow is 38 years of age and has missed the playoff six times in the last seven years. Fair enough. Take it easy. Appreciate the call. Mike, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Hey, uh, Stephen A., uh, quick uh, Laker Clipper question. Uh, Go ahead. Where, everything that I... Yeah, everything that I hear in the media, the, the Clippers seem to be a better destination when it comes to free agents. Uh, number one, the, the, regardless of what happened last night, they're going to be a first-round exit. And, and the Lakers could have did that had everyone stayed healthy. And, and, and number two, uh, the, the allure of this is my team once LeBron is done with his contract, why isn't that a stronger thing for big free agents to make a decision? Uh, this well, because, because – and, and I'll tell you why, because – you know what? Tomorrow is a guarantee. Do you know the thing that amazes me about your question? Everybody acts like it's okay and there should be such an elevated level of comfort to look for, towards the future. But we go to church and pray every week. We wake up every morning saying our prayers. We go to bed every night saying our prayers. Why? Because tomorrow is a guarantee. So if we know that about life, whether it's getting in a car and driving on the road, whether it's getting in a daggone plane, whether it's having lunch or dinner at a, at a restaurant in a hot dog or something like that, if that's the mentality that we have about life, why the hell shouldn't you have that mentality about sports? Why should you sit up there and go like this? Man, we'll be all right in three years. Who told you you got three years? That's the whole <laughs> point of that. Yeah, uh, that's true. I, I just think, you know, right now we got the biggest superstar in the game already donning a Lakers uniform. So uh, anybody pairing up with him, I, I feel like would elevate the Lakers. Well, you feel you can feel any way you you can feel any way you want to. With all due respect to the great, great, phenomenal LeBron James, because he is. And by the way, I'll be talking about him a little bit later on in the show. The great LeBron James. How many titles does LeBron James have? I think three. He's three. How many has he lost? Oh, quite <laughs> six, quite a- six. So no matter how great he is, evidently he ain't the only one, is he? You can't walk around with this attitude that tomorrow's guaranteed. You gotta go for it now. You gotta go for it now. And time to waste. You gotta go for it. He ain't getting any younger. That groin injury that kept him out for 17 games. Bro, he missed 17 games before. He missed it this year. Why? Because you can't predict these things. You take nothing for granted. That's the true element of success. Taking nothing for granted. Nothing. 888, say ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. By the way, mom has always been your forever biggest fan, unconditionally supporting you every step of the way. So this Mother's Day, show her just how much you appreciate the love with 1-800-Flowers.com. Right now, when you get ahead of the Mother's Day rush, 1-800-Flowers will give you an exclusive 36 for 36 offer. 36 sorbet roses for just $36. That's only a dollar per rose. So don't put this off. Order it today. To order 36 sorbet roses for $36, go to 1-800-Flowers.com. Click the radio icon and enter code Stephen A. That's 1-800-Flowers.com, code Stephen A. That's with a P-H, not a V. Hurry up! This fantastic offer ends Friday. 888 say ESPN is the number to call. I'll get to you, but not before I talk to my girl, NFL reporter extraordinaire, my buddy, the incomparable Josina Anderson, covering the Arizona Cardinals on the night of the NFL draft. She'll be at us live, with us live. Up next, Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN News. This show and all of ESPN is streaming live on the ESPN app. Now. 
who has done more with less? No one. And that, and that is what I, I think we've got to come to that conclusion. When you look at Steph Curry, you know, debating with Max earlier in the day, I'm like, Steph Curry's phenomenal. He's the greatest shooter I, I've ever seen. But it does help that you have Clay Thompson and Kevin Durant. And it does help that you have a point forward who's incredibly cerebral as a basketball player and Draymond Green as a point forward that gets underestimated and a system designed by Steve Kerr that also helps you. You're Damian Lillard. You've played 96% of the games in your career. You've only missed 24 games in seven years. You played 80 games this year. You're the number one option. Everybody knows it. You've had to play games without Nurkic. You've had to play games without D.J. McCullough. And you have done what this man has done and averaging what he is averaging and leading them to 53 wins in the season and, and giving them back-to-back number three seeds in the Western Conference. And, oh, by the way, six playoff game winners in NBA history. Two of them were by Michael Jordan. Another two was by Damian Lillard. At some point in time, when do you look at him, at least for this season, and say, excuse me, he doesn't deserve to be first team all NBA this season where you consider what he's had to work with, what he's been working against with CP3 and James Harden in Houston, with the big three in Golden State, with Russell Westbrook and Paul George in Oklahoma City. At some point in time, you do have to ask yourself, what does this man have to do to make first team? Yeah, he, he really is amazing. And, and today would be the day that you would pile all the accolades on him. But, you know, we, we watched the other night. James Harden goes three for 20. I think misses over. he was over his first 14 or 15 or whatever the number was, Stephen A. And you think to yourself, if Lillard ever gave you a game where he was three for 20, they'd probably lose the game by 27 points. That's right. I mean, uh, when, when Max is making the state the case this year, well, you know what? Even with you know without Steph Curry, the Golden State Warriors haven't been what we thought they would be. Well, what would the Portland Trailblazers be without Lillard? They'd be I they'd mean, be they'd nothing. They'd be terrible. They'd be, they'd be, they'd be, they'd be one of the worst teams in the league. Absolutely. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. And you can always get in touch with the show through the 1-800-Flowers Twitter feed. More businesses. Moreprogressivecommercial.com. Ladies and gentlemen, I got news. I got breaking news for you. This is very, very important. I need everybody to pay attention. I'm getting old. That's my breaking news. I'm getting old. And here's the evidence. I got somebody on the line with me, you know. It's one thing to respect your colleagues, but it's another thing to be touched by them. You know, you're like your proud papa. That's how, that's how you know I'm getting old. Because it's, like it's not like I feel like a proud friend or a proud big brother. I almost feel like a proud papa because she does such an amazing job covering the NFL for us. I'm so proud of her every time I see her on television or hear her on radio, covering the NFL in ways that very, very few females have done it throughout NFL history. She's phenomenal, she's fantastic, and she's in Arizona right now as well. I'm talking about the incomparable, the wonderful, Josina Anson. What's going on, girl? How are you? How are you doing? <laughs> Well, listen, Uncle Steve, that is quite an Wait introduction. Wait a minute, I don't hear her. You know What's the I problem? I don't you. hear Josina. I don't hear Josina. You can't hear the me? The sound. What's going on? The uh, sound. With, somebody needs to get that sound right. We can't hear Josina. Can, I'm sorry. You can't hear me? Do we have that sound available? Oh, no. We don't have the because audio? Because I'm seeing her. She looks great. She's in Arizona. She's having a Thank good time. You. Always breaking stories. No Josina, we're trying to get the technical difficulties ironed out. Okay, So just no give problem. me a second here. Because we don't okay, hear you, okay. I don't understand why. So we're trying to get right, well, that we'll fixed. The second we get I'll it fixed, Josina, you. I'll come right back to you. Please forgive us for that. Josina Anderson is in Arizona, and obviously the story of this draft potentially is the um, who the number one pick is going to be and whether or not that's going to be Kyler Murray. We anticipate it's going to be. I can promise you if, if, if it breaks, Josina will have it because she doesn't miss much. Please get that technological error handled, everybody. Bristol, New York, Nashville, and every place in between. Get it handled. Until we do, I'll go to a call real quick, John. 
Is that all right? Let me go to a call real quick while we get that Josina Anderson situation handled in Arizona. Let's my go check, to Mark check, and Queens. You're live with Stephen A. What's up? Oh, Josina, are you there? Are you there, Josina? I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, there she Can goes. There she goes. Yay. I got you now. Okay, there oh, you go. yes. <laughs> yes, yes. How are you, Josina? Yes. I Listen, Uncle Steve, I was saying that is quite an introduction, and you That's know right. I have very, very fond things to always say about you because you were there since I was a young pup, basically up underneath your wing in Washington, D.C., so thank you for that. Yeah, of course, <laughs> even though she's making me sound even older, but that's okay. I deserve it. I'm over 50. That's what comes with it, Josina. But let, let, let's get right to these Arizona Cardinals. Josina, are you, are you, do you believe, based on your reporting and everything that you're hearing, that they're going to take Colin Murray, or is it a smoke screen and they're going to move down? What are, your, what are your thoughts? What can you tell us? Well, a couple things here that are interesting. So last week, uh, Stephen, going into Easter weekend, I had heard from a source uh, connected to the Kyle Murray camp that they had received information within the building that pretty much assured them that it was good to go. And then there were reports that started to surface casting doubt on that. And the tone more so turned to, well, he's going to be good regardless. Uh, also knowing that potentially there's at least one team that could look to uh, make a move for him or make a selection for him. And I was saying, you know, keep an eye on the Oakland Raiders. But as I was talking to a source this morning, they said to me, Joe, do you know, you really think that Kyler Murray would be in Nashville if he didn't feel like it was a strong likelihood uh, that he would end up with the Arizona Cardinals. But here's the intriguing piece, Stephen, because even if you get Kyler Murray, you have to reconcile the issue with Josh Rosen. And right mm. now I'm hearing that Steve Kime is still trying to uh, get the appropriate compensation for Josh Rosen with the many people around the league feeling like that should at least be a second round pick, particularly since people consider him more ready than some of the quarterbacks that would be drafted in the first round tonight. And Steven, with the fact that there are differing opinions in the building as to whether Josh Rosen and Kyler Murray could coexist, right? You know, so some people feeling like it could potentially grow toxic, while other people, Stephen, point to the lack of experience in the quarterback depth, having Brett Hundley, who has a quarterback record of three and six, and oh, Chad no. Kinoff, who hasn't played a single down in the NFL. So you don't, want, you don't want Brett Hundley there. I listen, I'm no football aficionado, but I'm here to tell you, you don't want Brett Hundley in there. Oh, hell no. No, 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 no. You can't go that route. I'm sorry, Joe Cena. But I will ask you this. I will ask you this. Josh Rosen at number 10, when you talk about Steve Kahn trying to find equitable compensation for him, this is a guy that went 10th overall in last year's NFL draft. Number 10 overall, first round pick. To me, is it a situation where you're trying to get equitable compensation or is it more glaring to you that nobody seems to want Josh, Josh Rosen? Well, it's it's a combination of, you know, you're you're going to best leverage the situation starting today because depending on how the board falls, Stephen, a situation could be created where a team misses out on a quarterback and then Steve Kimes' leverage is increased. Also adding to the fact that you don't actually have to conduct the deal today. Something could be done, you know, tomorrow as well. So he's going to come in here with active ears and listen to the best situation, um, you know, but again, do you do you if you don't if you get rid of Josh Rosen, right, then that mm -hmm. basically means that you're all in with Kyler Murray and you're living with that as your quarterback depth, which is why even though perhaps it's the minority voice, there are people still saying, Josina, we cannot do that. We have to have a better situation in the event that even if you get Kyler Murray, what if he gets injured? So, you know, you, you, you have to still solve that piece, and I think that that's what he's looking to do. I mean, as of right now, they're hearing just from the Giants or the Dolphins as far as, uh, you know, perhaps for a backup situation. I just got off the phone uh, with the source from the Chargers who said, look, there is some interest there. We did some early homework, um, but we don't know who they're picking. So right now we're moving on. So I think that's just in their hip pocket, nothing that they're pressing. I would still keep an eye on the Green Bay Packers. You know, we'll see if that happens or if that materializes. But on the same token, you have people in this building who advocate for Nick Bosa. Bill Davis, the linebackers coach here, used to coach him last season at Ohio State. And then lastly, I just got off the phone before you guys called me with uh, the agent for 
Quinn and Williams, who just underlined that it was relayed to them uh, that he's still potentially in the picture. And I know that a majority of the defensive people in this building uh, think that Quinn and Williams is the best player on the board, saying he's the most dominant player that they've seen, and they haven't seen someone jump off just raw game field, not highlight tapes, but raw game field, film, rather, the way that Quinn and, Quinn and Williams does. Mm, so we're seeing the answer right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. You're very, very familiar with the New York Giants as well, and obviously with Dwayne Haskins doing mm. what he did at Ohio State. The belief by most was that it's a foregone conclusion that if he lands at number six, if he's available, rather, once the Giants pick at six and they don't give away that pick, that they're going to grab him. But the more you hear, the more you're realizing that it's possible that the Giants will go to def the route of taking a defensive player. In light of your interview months ago with Odell Beckham Jr., and we know what he didn't say. He did every damn thing but wink for crying out loud as to what Eli Manning was no longer. The reality is, one would surmise, they should take a quarterback, but that doesn't seem to be the direction that they're going in. Is that a smokescreen, or is that real on the part of the New York Giants from what you're hearing? Well, the latest thing that I heard from a source that I trust is that obviously they have the pick at six and they have the pick at 17. And mm -hmm. at the time, and I haven't talked to them yesterday, the quarterbacks that they were looking at were the Dwayne Haskins and Drew Lott. And that potentially they could either go for one of those quarterbacks at six and go alignment, either O-line, D-line with the 17 or flip-flop that and go with the defensive, uh, you know, player, defensive lineman or rush, you know, uh, pass rusher yep. and then go with uh, the quarterback at 17. It remains to be seen how they actually end up doing that, uh, Stephen, because I still think how the board falls still impacts which way that they go. But um, right now, I would think that they would go with that defensive player um, mm -hmm. with six and then take the quarterback. But if there's movement around that kind of presents Dwayne Haskins right there, then, you know, who knows? So, but at, but at least those are the narrowed down options that I have been hearing. But, uh, you know, very interesting tea coming out of the Giants building between Dave Gettleman and Odell Beckham Jr. going back and forth uh, the last couple of days for sure. No question about it. Before I let you get on out of here, I have perhaps the most important question I need to ask you. Is that a jacket you're wearing or a blouse top or whatever? Because it's pretty damn fly. What is that? What is that? Well, listen here. I appreciate the opportunity, right? It is a jacket, actually, okay. uh, that is, just has one sleeve. It comes right. fresh from Australia from my favorite designer, Matuszewski. So that excuse is what it is. Me. And I got a pair of pants it, it, that goes along it, it, with it. it, it so it, there you excuse, go. excuse me. I didn't I like mean, the, the I, did, I didn't like the different <laughs> kind of jacket that Russell Westbrook was rocking the other day. But that is slamming. Josina Anderson, girl, do Thank your you. thing. I'll definitely look forward to watching you tonight for the NFL. Draft. All the best to you, sweetie. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. 888. 888. Say Thank ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. You can talk to people like that when they're your friends. You know, for those that are looking at me, oh, y'all seem cool. No, Josina Anderson and I go back decades, just so y'all know. We're great, great friends. That jacket is kind of fly. I got, I got, I might have to buy that for somebody. I might have to do something like that. I have to buy that. That's a pretty fly jacket. No question. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Back with your calls to close out the show in a minute. With Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. By the way, if you missed any of today's show, go check it out on demand in the Stephen A. Smith podcast. Brought to you by the Capital One Saver Card. Earn 4% cash back on dining and entertainment, 2% of grocery stores, and 1% on all other purchases. Hey, hey, what's in your wallet? The Stephen A. Smith Show is being brought to you by Barbasol. Hey, sports fans. Barbasol is 